big and weird animals. They've been a thing multiple times throughout Earth's history, not only evolving unique features that set them apart from the rest of their clade, but also pushing the limits as to what sizes an animal can reach. The best example we have on land today are elephants. So let's take a look at how they got to this point and if they have really hit their peak yet. Now hopefully you all know what an elephant is. So today I'm retaking you through the clade that elephant actually belong to, which is the order known as Proboscidea. So obviously elephants have been known since, well, forever, and have been domesticated and utilized by humans for as long as 4,000 years. But the idea of Proboscideans as a whole wasn't set in stone until much later. Reports of mammoths have stretched all the way back to indigenous tribes in Siberia, with findings of teeth of them as well as mastodons and stegodonts, becoming more and more common as the 19th century approached. Eventually, enough remains were discovered from various families to justify the naming of a new order by Johann Illiger in 1811, naming them Proboscideans or Elephant's Trunk. Now, describing the members of this group is pretty easy because they're all very much like elephants. There were some exceptions to this, especially with the smaller and more basal members, such as Phosphotherium and Moeritherium. But most Proboscideans showcased very deep bodies, relatively long pillar-like legs, very short necks, large skulls that housed very unique teeth, some form of tusks, and a large nasal fenestra that preceded a trunk. They were also, as you may have guessed, pretty big. Whilst modern elephants boast the largest terrestrial animal of today in the African bush elephants, with bulls reaching heights of 11 feet and just shy of 7 tons, these aren't actually all that impressive when compared to other extinct members of this order. Many members of families such as the Dinotheridae, Stegodontidae and Mamutidae would hit around the same sizes as today's elephants, maybe a little smaller or larger, but certain genera such as mammoths could reach heights of 4 meters or 13 feet tall and around 10 tons. But those that have watched my Paleoloxodon video will know that this is far from the limit, with the potentially biggest size we've seen so far in terrestrial mammals still belonging to true elephants is this beast may have reached heights of 5.2 meters or 7.1 feet and a possible 22 tons in weight. Now these sizes are not definite, but this would make Paleoloxodon the biggest mammal to ever walk the earth. Now as mammals, all Proboscideans would have had one of the most characteristic features of this group and that is hair covering them to varying degrees. Some would have had hair that wouldn't have really been visible from a distance like modern elephants, whilst others boast many specimens with preserved soft tissue remains such as woolly mammoths, they show thick, shaggy fur all over their bodies. What's more interesting about this clade, though, is the actual story about how they became this widespread group that attained the biggest sizes that we've ever seen in terrestrial mammals. Proboscideans actually go pretty far back for mammals, with the earliest member, Erytherium, living in Africa during the early Paleocene around 60 million years ago. Coming in at around 1.6 to 2 feet long, this little guy would have heavily resembled a tapir, and much like those lovable guys, it's highly likely that Erytherium had a semi-aquatic lifestyle, showing more similarities to the future sister lineages to Proboscideans of Cyrenians and Desmostylians. A pretty humble life, but still pretty impressive considering that they got a good start just 5 million years after the KPG mass extinction, a time where much of the world was the battleground for reptiles trying to take back their throne. As the Eocene came along, a few more genera from Africa showed that whilst the Proboscideans had made a huge amount of drastic changes, they were also expanding and diversifying, as shown by the likes of Moetherium and Barotherium. What was a real turning point for Proboscideans, however, was during the early Miocene, a time in which the African continent began to conjoin with the rest of Eurasia, with this landmass also then joining onto the Americas a couple of million years after that. Proboscideans were one of the groups to take advantage of this and expand even further, taking their evolution from slow to extremely rapid. As this group spread across Eurasia and the Americas, they adapted very quickly to these very climates, especially flourishing in the colder steppes. Across Europe and the lower latitudes of Asia were the Dinotheres, a very elephant-like family with the exception of the tusks being on the lower jaw, using them for sheer browsing. This was alongside Gonthotheres, which had a pair of tusks on both the upper and lower jaw, stegodons, the very strange shovel mouse known as umbelodontids, and of course mastodons. 
Most of these then spread to the more northern regions of Asia, before crossing the Bering Land Bridge into North America and radiating from there. But things were still happening back in Africa, as around 10 million years ago the earliest groups of elephantid proposidians emerged here. This particular family is one that most of us are familiar with, containing the famous mammoths, Loxodonta and Elephus, or the African and Asian elephants respectively, and Paleoloxodon, the elephantid which I mentioned earlier that is quite possibly the biggest land mammal to ever live, which I'll talk more about here. From here, Loxodonta held the fort in Africa whilst the rest of elephantids did the same as their relatives and dispersed into Eurasia, then subsequently North America around 3.6 to 3.2 million years ago. As the Pleistocene progressed, however, proboscideans began to drop away outside of the Americas. In fact, for a while, this group didn't really exist outside of the Americas and the elephantids in Africa. At the time of North and South America joining, Gomphotheres partook in the Great American Interchange by crossing over and dispersing into South America, whilst the mammoths pushed through Eurasia and began radiating throughout North America around 1.5 million years ago, with some populations even developing into the dwarfism. Now, the success of various species as a result of the Great American Interchange was a mixed bag. But the South American Gomphotheres fared pretty well for a time, with the mammoths soon thriving across the Northern Hemisphere. They did, however, face a bit of new competition when a fellow elephantid also made it out of Africa and spread around Eurasia around 800,000 years ago, that being the Paleoloxodon. Not only being the possible biggest land mammal, Paleoloxodon is a genus that has also given us a range of species of varying sizes and habitats, from the biggest to the smallest. But unfortunately, this incredible group joined the very many in a significant decline during the worldwide late Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions. And to say that Proboscideans suffered would be an understatement too. Only two groups of elephantids were left, those being true elephants in Asia and Africa, and the very last mammoths left on the entire planet. This was the classic woolly mammoth, which lived in an isolated population on Wrangell Island in the Bering Strait managing to live right up until the construction of the Pyramids of Giza 4,000 years ago. Now in terms of how they were living in these environments, this is also where we see a lot of similarities with modern elephants as well. Most proboscideans have shown varying degrees of evidence for herding behaviour, namely large groups of females and juveniles, with the males leaving when they reach a certain age. After this, they would have likely lived a solitary lifestyle, or perhaps in very small groups if they were close enough friends. But if they were similar enough to modern elephants, those friendships would be fragile during mating seasons, known here specifically as must. But if we are talking intelligence and social behaviour within this group, we can't just leave it there considering how famous elephants are for this. Elephants have shown exceptional intelligence in a variety of different ways, and considering this is a trait that is often passed on to varying degrees within an order, it stands to reason that other proboscideans likely shared at least some of these traits. Now, intelligence is a hard one to pin down. In fact, we don't necessarily know how to define it as we have found out more about it and discovered more about cognitive functions of other animals, many of which outdo us by miles in many areas. Elephants are one of those animals, showing a greater cerebral cortex volume available for cognitive functioning than any other land animal, with more brain folds than even any primates. In fact, in terms of brain function inferred from morphology, these guys are on the same level as cetaceans, which far outcompete us. Now, morphology is great and all, but what about the actual behavior that we can see with our own eyes? Well, accounts go back countless years that speak of elephants' seemingly endless empathy, showing close-knit societal groups that have such deep bonds, stories of those bonds ending are beyond heartbreaking. Their altruism isn't just limited to their own species either, with elephants showing concern and a willingness to help other species if needed, even going out of their way to avoid harming a human if they feel it's unnecessary. Not that certain members of our own species have returned the favour. They've also been shown to play, mimic other animals, create art, recognise music, solve complex problems, show signs of self-awareness and even adopt death rituals including burying and showing respect to their fallen. So again, this brings us back to the question of what kind of incredible displays of intelligence have we missed out on seeing from other extinct members of Proboscideans? 
Now that is a big subject, so I'm gonna let you discuss that down below whilst I answer today's two questions. The first of which comes from Derek K8523, who's asked, did dinos have taste buds? Did they like ice cream? Uh, yes, they most certainly had taste buds because taste buds are a pretty crucial part of any animal's survival. Uh, but however, if they were anything like modern dinosaurs, i.e. birds, they probably wouldn't be able to taste as much as us mammals do. For reference, most birds have anywhere between 50 to 500 taste buds on their tongues, whereas humans alone have around 10,000. But the only birds that can really detect sweet things are those that are specialized for sugary nectar. So a dinosaur would likely give or take ice cream. Then again, I've still heard the same thing about sweet receptors in cats, and CC still laps up custard like no one's business. Uh, our next one comes from Patron Sabraxis, who has asked, why do we know Slash been able to find so many genera of dinosaurs hanging from Laramidia of the Lake Cretaceous, whilst we know of so few from the neighboring Appalachia? Couldn't read Appalachia then for a second, sorry. Uh, I mean, the maps always show the two subcontinents to be of approximately the same size. Sometimes Appalachia seems to flaunt even more real estate. So logically, the diversity of fauna or megafauna in Appalachia must have been, or at least should have been, as great as in the overexposed Laramidia. Right? P.S. Maybe an entire video about Appalachia would come in as handy. Noted. So yeah, Laramania does seem to get all of the attention along with the Western Interior Seaway when it comes to Lake Cretaceous North America. But what about Appalachia? Was it actually shrouded in mystery or was it just a bit boring? Well, it was actually more of a mystery that was heavily overshadowed by its sibling Laramidia. Not only was Laramidia rocking all of the famous dinosaurs like T-Rex and Triceratops, but it would also appear that Appalachia simply wasn't quite as good at preserving land animals in general. You see, not many terrestrial deposits have survived over the last 66 million years, and as a result, most of the animal finds come from the Western Interior Seaway deposits. Due to the relative lack of preservation, interest in Appalachia drops off pretty quickly in favor of Laramidia. So there is still quite a lot more to potentially uncover from here. So that's actually all I'm going to say on the subject because doing a whole video on it is a really good idea. So thank you for that. So you can look forward to that until I catch you guys next time.